Well, joining us this hour for more is Ryan Bold. He's senior Middle East and North Africa analyst at RAIN. Uh, Ryan, I want to welcome you to the show. Thank you very much for joining us. I want to start by asking you about the, the fact that most people seem to be expecting some sort of a response from Israel. Are you in that camp as well? And is Israel going to go crazy or do you expect a more measured response? So I certainly do expect a response and I certainly expect more on the measured side of things. And that's in large part because Israel is under enormous diplomatic pressure from its key ally, the United States, not to destabilize the region with uh, strikes on Iran itself that could provoke this tit-for-tat uh, missile and drone cycle that we're starting to see evolve. For that matter, it's not exactly in Israel's interest to get stuck in that cycle either, because as we've seen in the region already, the U.S. is carrying out this open-ended campaign against the Houthis in Yemen, and they really don't have an exit strategy there so long as the Houthis have the armaments to continue that campaign. Iran is much bigger, much more capable, and so if Israel enters that sort of back and forth escalation. It's not clear when it'll end. And it's certainly, if they do go on to that path, it's almost certain that one of these Iranian barrages, barrages will get past the Israeli air defenses and cause significant civilian and military casualties. Well, Ryan, uh, who are the allies of Iran? I mean, we know that has, you know, the axis of resistance. Uh, who are the allies of Israel? What stake do all of these players have in the conflict and how might they react? So in terms of our axis of resistance fighters, many of them have political incentives to continue their attacks against Israel and against those powers that are seen as backing Israel, like the United States. And those political drivers are why they're doing what they're doing. They're gaining credibility on the ground. And most of them come from systems where there's no elections for them to restore their, their legitimacy. So this is one of their most effective ways to win back support. That's Hezbollah in Syria. There's a variety of militias within Syria itself. It's the Houthis in Yemen and a series of Iraqi militias uh, within Iraq. And, and as long as they've got those political incentives to continue these harassment campaigns, those conflicts remain somewhat open-ended. On the other side, the Israelis don't exactly have any clean allies in this current conflict. It has the United States, which is acting as something of a shield for Israel. They're uh, protecting them diplomatically. But as of uh, yesterday, on April 13th, they're also protecting them directly by intervening against the Iranian attacks. Beyond that, Israel doesn't have a lot of natural allies that wants to see them escalate any further than the situation currently is. Ryan, I want to ask your thoughts you know, on something I'm trying to make sense of. Some reports suggesting that Iran carried out the attacks in phases giving the idea of time to react and, and, of course, limit the damage. Others are saying, uh, you know, the, Iran was testing Israel's air defences. Is it possible at this stage to say which is the more, more likely scenario? I think many things were true all at once in the course of this attack. We do know, of course, Iran signaled very heavily, uh, both through media and through their diplomats and through some back channels, that this attack was coming at a certain scale. And we've even got some reports that suggest that they may have been telegraphing this pretty intensely to the United States, although the U.S. still uh, denies that those reports are, are, are accurate. Nevertheless, I Iran made it clear that they wanted this to be a politically symbolic moment. They wanted to show that they would strike back directly against Israel and take the shadow war out of the shadows and possibly keep it there in an overt sense uh, for a long period of time. So in that sense, the Iranians were doing an attack that wasn't designed to destroy Israel's military capabilities or, or just, uh, cause direct damage to its cities. Uh, it was more of a political attack using uh, drones and missiles and, and, and uh, these, other, these other systems uh, designed to, again, showcase that Iran would respond to Israeli military action. On the other hand, uh, I do think that Iran was using this as a learning experience. This is some of the longest strikes they've ever taken uh, against our rival. It is against a very advanced air defense system. So I certainly do think that the Iranians learned something uh, from this operation. Yes, you said taking the you know, shadow war out of the shadows. Now, how has this latest um, attack changed the dynamics of this conflict, this long-standing conflict between Iran and Israel? Could we see more direct attacks between the two? I think that there is that strong risk that the two of them will strike each other more and more or, or overtly. And we can end up in a situation in which we are seeing Iran carrying out barrages like these on occasion and Israel striking back directly uh, against Iran itself. That, I don't think that's necessarily the first step 
of where we go in the coming days. But I think that we are on that escalation ladder where it could be an open-ended conflict where the two of them are firing these attacks or launching these attacks against one another on long range. You know, it's important to note, they don't really share, uh, they don't have a, a, a shared geography. Iran is obviously not on Israel's border. And so they will always remain something of a, of a conflict at a distance. And in that sense, it could echo some of what we're seeing with Russia and Ukraine, where they're carrying out strikes against one another deeper and deeper into each other's territories. Um, that is a possibility. Again, I don't think that's the most likely thing to happen immediately, but that's certainly the path that we're on right now. Ryan, just want to circle back to your point about a measured, a possible measured response from Israel. Is this going to be a military response, or is it possible that they could heed Joe Biden's words, take this as a win, and go for other non-military options, maybe like Stuxnet, Stuxnet, for example? I certainly do think that they will consider the cyber component, but the problem with the cyber response is that it won't restore the traditional deterrence that existed on April 12th. That is, that that deterrence was that Iran knew that striking Israel itself was an escalation that was considered to be unacceptable. Uh, that uh, deterrence has now been broken, and Israel needs to reestablish it with something kinetic. Now, what that kinetic attack looks like, it could be something symbolic, uh, something that's politically important, like striking launch sites that perhaps don't have anybody in them or, or attacking locations within Iran that aren't strategically important to Iran's government. Those sorts of things could happen. And we should perhaps remember, you know, as recently as January, uh, Pakistan and Iran also had a border clash where Pakistan fired missiles into Iranian territory and everyone walked away from it. So that is a possibility that the Israelis are able to gauge some sort of targeting within Iran itself that isn't too politically sensitive to the Iranians, that doesn't result in another swarm attack. But that's a very difficult uh, uh, task ahead of them. Nevertheless, I think that that's what they're probably considering right now, is what can they strike inside of Iran that might not be so important to Tehran that another cycle of drone and, and missiles comes towards Israel. Hi, Ryan. We appreciate your time. Ryan Bode, senior Middle East and North Africa analyst at RAIN.